Okay, this is Dean Melvick at the University of Minnesota, speaking to you from St. Paul. Um, glad to be here with you today. So I, I'm a plant pathologist here working across the state, mainly with corn and soybeans and diseases that affect those crops. And today I'll be talking about some new disease challenges that are um, cropping up across the state along with our crops. So the ones I will focus on today are actually frog eye leaf spot, the first on this list, and corn tar spot, the last on the list. But I'm also going to mention the three in the middle here, corn bacterial leaf streak, physoderma brown spot, and stock rot, and southern corn rust. Now, I don't bring these up suggesting other diseases aren't important out there. White mold, uh, rhizoctonia, stock rots. Of course, there are many others that are continual problems across the state at some place. But this is meant to highlight these since they are generally new and emerging and um, many folks aren't familiar with them and just want to bring them to everyone's attention. So first of all, first one, frog eye leaf spot, a fungal leaf disease of soybean has been common across the southern USA for a very long time and it's nothing new down there and yield losses up to 30 percent have been reported you know in the southern part of the country and fungicides are often used specifically for managing this disease and it's favored by warm and humid weather uh, such as is very common in the southern part of the u.s but has this disease has been increasing in southern minnesota in the last two years up into central minnesota as well and it's not just us it certainly has been increasing across iowa as well and as well as in south dakota so there is an increase, I suspect, um, driven in a large part by our wet summer weather conditions we've had recently. And it's reached high levels in a few fields in Minnesota, South Central Minnesota in 2019. At least one of them I'm aware of was high enough levels such that fungicides were sprayed on the crops specifically to control frog eye leaf spot. So that level is uncommon so far, but again, it seems to be an increasing disease that we should watch for. And a little bit more about it, what are the symptoms? I mean, we all know when we go into soybean fields in July and early August, there are lots of um, different kinds of things that happen on leaves that some are concerning and some are not. But this disease develops these brown tannish leaf spots surrounded by a darker reddish brown or purple ring. I think you can see it pretty well in these two photographs. These are from leaves um, collected in Minnesota. And those spots can coalesce and, and create a, a lot more leaf damage than you see here. But that's the typical symptom, the, the tan spots surrounded by a darker ring. And uh, how do we manage this disease if it becomes a problem? Well, in many parts of the country, there is resistance in soybean varieties that are widely used. I don't know that we have such a thing, or at least not clearly labeled as such in Minnesota for our, our maturity group. There may be some available, but again, it certainly has not been a focus of the breeding effort because the disease has not been a significant and continuing problem. Crop rotation and tillage make a difference because the pathogen survives on infected soybean leaves from a previous crop. And if those leaves are in a field or nearby, um, the uh, incidence and, and rate of infection certainly is higher. Um, but probably a, a key way this disease is managed if it becomes a, a problem is to use foliar fungicides. Now the obvious question is what's the threshold? There is no definite threshold but growth stage, disease level, and variety susceptibility all important in making that decision and timing at the R3, R4 growth stage appears to be optimal. Now this is challenged by resistance in the fungal pathogen population that causes this disease frog out leaf spot. So this is caused by a Cercospora pathogen, not the same one that causes um, problems on, on sugar beet. It's a different pathogen and they don't cross infect each other. But the key point that I want to bring up here is fungicides that in the QOI, the Strabillion class, are not very effective against frog out leaf spot because that frog out leaf spot pathogen is widely resistant to that class of fungicides. And that's been confirmed in 15 states and we confirmed it in Minnesota in 2019. 
So the upshot of that is if we need uh, to spray uh, to control fungi, frog eye leaf spot, we need to use products that contain more than strobilirins and a high enough concentration of a non strobilirin active ingredient to provide effective management. And uh, for more information on what's available, there's a website called the Crop Protection Network that provides a summary of, of relative efficacy of different fungicides for frog eye leaf spot. So again, I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on each of these diseases. Um, I'm gonna briefly mention three more and then spend a little bit more on, on tar spot of corn at the end. But the other one I mentioned briefly is bacterial leaf streak. This is also a relatively new disease in Minnesota, not known before 2016 or 17, right in there. And this is a bacterial disease, obviously. Um, the symptoms you can see pretty clearly in this picture from Indiana. First report of this disease came out of Indiana and in Illinois in 2017. And it's most common in fields and continuous corn production and where there's a lot of rainfall and hot and very warm weather conditions. And uh, we've seen a lot of it here in Minnesota sweet corn fields. And we confirmed this year that it can reduce the yield of sweet corn significantly. So although it's often more or less a superficial disease, not significant enough, especially in field dent corn to cause yield loss, um, the point here is that it can reach levels that are significant in sweet corn. And we don't know for sure yet if it can reach that level in field corn. And a bit more information here, uh, some more pictures here on the left. This is from a, a leaf uh, in south central Minnesota on the left. And the counties where we confirmed um, frog eye leaf spot, excuse me, bacterial leaf streak here are shown in the shaded counties here in the Minnesota map on the right. And over time, the disease has been spreading. So in that triangular area and in the gray areas, that's the area where we've seen most of the disease in the south central um, to southwestern part of the state. So the disease does seem to be spreading to some extent and it is something to watch for. Again, I, we think the biggest risk is in sweet corn at this point in time. In other states like Nebraska where they've had this quite frequently there, the biggest risk is in popcorn. So um, again, field corn doesn't seem to be as great a risk, but it is something I think we need to watch for because we've seen levels of concern in that as well. And moving on to another disease, uh, this is a rust disease. So the spores of this fungus that cause corn rust blow up from the southern U.S. every year. We often see common corn rust. This southern corn rust is a little different. It's sometimes been considered a tropical disease and it's been recently becoming more common in the upper Midwest, including Minnesota. And it potentially poses a greater risk to field corn than common rust for a couple of reasons. One, it likes warmer conditions which is often what we have when this rust comes up from the southern U.S. By the time it comes up in late July or into early August, we have warmer conditions, conditions that are not favorable often for common rust. It also means this is a, a bit greater risk also because the corn hybrids that we commonly use don't have the same inherent level of resistance to southern rust as common rust on average. So this is also, like, like I say, a fungus, spores blow up from the southern U.S. The symptoms are similar in some ways. Uh, cinnamon to brown pustules on the upper leaf surface primarily, although they're a little bit more orange and lighter color than the common rust. It's favored by warm temperatures and high humidity, hence the reason why it's sometimes called a southern or a tropical rust. And here are a couple of pictures just to indicate how they look. Southern rust on the left, common rust on the right in that picture. You can see the common rust has generally darker pustules. The, the southern rust have more orange colored pustules. And then the common rust tends to be more common, the pustules on both sides of the leaf surface where the southern rust is more common on the upper leaf surfaces often and more in bunches, especially as you can see there on the left. And we may ask, well, where is this occurring? So there is some effort to monitor where southern rust is developing across the U.S. Uh, for the past few years, you can see a few counties here in Minnesota where we confirmed it, you know, as far north as Stearns County. 
And this doesn't mean, of course, that it was only in those counties. This is where we actually received samples and confirmed that it was southern rust. I suspect it's was pretty widespread across southern Minnesota, not necessarily at damaging levels. And the fields where I saw it, it tended to come on late, later than would be significant in terms of causing any yield loss. But again, I think this is a disease to watch for and to monitor for, since it can be a concern. And the last one I will mention briefly before we go on to tar spot is this Physoderma brown spot and stock red, another fungal type disease. And you can see that picture on the left with the brown spots and the leaves, which is you know, very mature lesions, you know, very well developed, but you can see the, the brown spots where the name comes from, both on the leaf and on the midrib of the leaf. And in the middle, um, you can see the, the earlier symptoms, which are yellowish spots, um, which often occur in bands across the leaf. And that's a characteristic uh, pattern for this disease. And the far right is where the biggest concern is, and that is this stalk or node rot phase of, of physoderma, which has been increasing in Minnesota and in Iowa over the past five years or so. It was relatively uncommon and, and relatively new, but it's being seen more and more. So this is something we wanna watch for. We don't have a clear management strategy for this at all, although there may be some evidence that you know, relatively early fungicide applications might be helpful, but again, we don't have enough data to say for sure that's true how, or how effective they are, which fungicides might work best. But again, I think this is something we need to watch for, and since it does seem to be increasing. I think the, the most common area for this has been South Central Minnesota up to this point. Now I wanna move into uh, a, a main topic for today's discussion, that's tar spot of corn. And this is a, a brand new problem in Minnesota, although we've been watching it in states that are southeast for a few years. Uh, but this year it actually came into Minnesota and it seems to be spreading each year. So what is tar spot of corn? Why should we be concerned? Of course, given a new disease, we never know for sure what level of problem it may actually cause. But disease is established now in the Midwest. We know it overwinters. There was some initial question about that when it was first found about four or five years ago, but we know it can overwinter in the Midwest. And the disease has been spreading, as I mentioned, including into southeastern Minnesota this year. And I'll show you the map in a moment. It's caused a significant yield loss in the Midwest. Some estimates were as high as 40 bushels or maybe even a bit more um, per acre in some fields in 2018 in southern Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. So it is a disease to, to watch for. And again, it can be a significant problem. And it can develop quickly from what we're seeing, typically late in the season though. And it may be challenging to manage and I'll mention more of that in a minute. So a bit of background on this. So this is another brand new problem in the US. First found in, in 2015, at a north central Illinois and north central Indiana. It was a bit of a curiosity then. At that point in time, people reported it, but nobody thought it would become a significant problem for a number of reasons that I won't get into today. But that thinking turned out not to be true. And so it's caused by the fungus Phylochlorum matus, and it produces small semicircular raised black structures um, on the leaves, like you can see in the picture here. They're small, they're dark, um, very much like tar, as dark as tar. And so that's where the name comes from. And I'll show you more photos in a few moments. And <coughs> sometimes these black lesions are surrounded by tan lesions. And I'll show you a picture of that too. It's called fisheye lesions. We have not seen much of that in Minnesota so far. And corn at any growth stage is susceptible to infection, although most of the disease really develops late in the year, uh, well after tasseling so far from what we've seen. So again, it's been estimated to reduce yields substantially in some fields, although in most of those fields there are also other leaf diseases, including gray leaf spot and northern corn leaf blight. So the conditions that favor tar spot also favor some of the other leaf diseases that can be yield reducing. So the pathogen here, this fungus, uh, it seems to survive on residue on the surface. And, and our 
northern climates don't seem to limit its survival over the winter. It's favored by cool temperatures in the summer and high humidity. So when we have you know, cool periods, lots of rain, that seems to make a big difference. In other parts of the country where there's irrigation, that greatly seems to improve the, the level of infection and increase the level of disease severity too. So again, what about, what do we know about where it is? Again, like I said, it was first found in North Central Illinois and North Central Indiana. Up through 2019, it had spread into all the counties shown in red here on that map. Not one of those counties were in Minnesota yet, although one was approaching it or one was bordering it in, in Wisconsin, as you can see in the very southeast corner of Minnesota. And then Iowa had a few counties reported in the very eastern part. Now, as of now, January 2020, you can see um, how the distribution has increased. It's, it's increased to the east. If you look into Michigan and Indiana and Ohio, there's more there. A few more counties in Illinois and Wisconsin. But where you know, we really need to pay attention is the fact that we've confirmed it in four counties in Minnesota, again, in the southeastern, very, very south central part of the state. And you can see Iowa, most of the counties in Iowa have had confirmed tar spot. Now, many of those counties had extremely low levels, meaning only a few lesions found per field. But nonetheless, you know, what, what we note there in, is important is that the pathogen is much more widespread across that state than we knew before. And I suspect it's more widespread across southern Minnesota than we know at this point too. So again, symptoms of tar spot. Um, on the far left, you know, it's a pretty severe case of, of a leaf with you know, probably 60% infection or something like that. These are from Michigan. The pathogen can also cause symptoms on, on the husks. You can see the black spots on the ear there in the middle. And on the far right are the, is a picture showing the tar spot symptoms uh, that are called fisheye lesions which are the black spots surrounded by the tannish halo. Now this is commonly observed in Latin America where this disease has been studied for quite a while, but we're not seeing it very much in the US. Although again, some places we do see it. In the fields that I saw it in Minnesota, I saw very few symptoms like that. Most of it is looking like the symptoms on the far left. Although most leaves were not quite that severe more pictures of symptoms here. And these are pictures I took in Minnesota, fields in the southeastern part of the state. And the far upper left picture shows very low level symptoms. But nonetheless, you can see the fairly large tar spot symptoms and some much smaller, which are more characteristic of a lot of fields. And then you can see different levels here in the lower left, um, much more, and high, much higher levels here in the two pictures on the right. Again, reaching levels, certainly that could be resulting in yield loss if this came in early enough and on enough leaves per plant. So I think a key question we have moving forward is how widespread is the disease and what conditions you know, favor its spread and its development in Minnesota? It's a lot we don't know yet. We have more questions, I think, than answers. But I think a, a key thing we'll try to do this year is scout a lot more for it, put a lot more deliberate effort into looking for it. So scouting is challenged by a few things. The symptoms may be confused with a few other diseases and maybe insect. Uh, symptoms may have low severity in incidents in fields, but then they seems like they can increase rapidly. And the symptoms may not be visible on the edges. And with a few following slides, I'll, I'll follow up on this point. So some of the common diseases that can be confused with tar spot are rust. Rust pustules on corn leaves as they age can become very dark, almost black, and they can be confused. Physoderma brown spot, as I mentioned earlier, that can produce very dark spots on leaves. That can be confused at times. And also insect frass, that can be confused. And I know this year in Michigan, where the disease was 
was being watched for very carefully after what happened in 2018. There was a lot of looking for it, you know, in early in the season, meaning or mid season. And there was a lot of confusion with, with basically with insect droppings. But of course they can be wiped off easily with a finger where the tar spot lesions are adhered tightly to the leaf surface and cannot be removed. Scouting for tar spot, um, a few key points here. Um, here's a leaf again with various levels of symptoms, uh, sizes actually, but some of the leaves in Iowa only had a couple of these lesions among 100 leaves in a field. So although they had the disease there, it was at low levels. So the fact that it was so low makes it hard to find without a lot of deliberate scouting. And that's one thing we need to do this year. And whether or not this could become a concern at this level, subsequent years, we're not sure. And the other thing is it may not be visible on field edges. Now this is true of many diseases, but just to illustrate the point here is that in the first field I went into this year in Southern Fillmore County, there was no disease visible within the first 50 yards or so from the edge of the field. And we had to walk in quite a way to see it at all. So without some diligent scouting, it would not have been found. Another example here from Michigan, you can see fields from the air with uh, tan areas. That is where tar spot is developing. You can see many of them are not near the edge of the field. So somebody just drove along this field here on this left-handed photo and looked near this edge, excuse me, um, you wouldn't see it, but there's a lot of it developing in the middle and you can see it in a similar way on this picture on the right. And the disease can develop quickly. For example, here over two weeks from September 21st to October 4th in Northern Indiana, just last year, the disease rapidly increased from moderate levels, maybe low levels to extremely high levels as you can see in that right-handed picture. So the disease that, that can really expand quickly, but this does usually seem to happen in later August into September. Another example here, tar spot progression in Michigan, 2018. The disease was very, very, low, very low levels you know, in, in the 8th of August, but by the end of August, it had reached very high levels. So again, it can progress very quickly once it gets going, especially later in the summer. And again, another example of this progression, another field, fields from Michigan. You can see uh, the picture of the field on the left, low levels on August 24th, two weeks later, much, much more. Um, most of this, as I understand, was due to, to tar spot. This change from this level to this level, obviously very significant. So to, to wrap this up, just a few final points. And we need to look for this 2020. I don't know that it will be a significant problem in any fields in Minnesota, but the potential is certainly there for it to be. We need to scout beginning in late July, especially in wet areas. Ultimately, we need to rotate to other crops, manage corn residue. Fungicides look promising for managing this. Mixed modes of action are probably going to be very important. An application needs to be done when the epidemic is starting. It's going to be hard to play catch up with it. Manage irrigation if applicable because rainfall or irrigation really seems to push this disease along pretty quickly. It doesn't develop well under dry conditions. And ultimately hybrids with low susceptibility or resistance will likely become important for disease management. Although we don't have enough information yet to say which of those are. So in summary then I've talked about these uh, five diseases with a focus on frog eye leaf spot and corn tar spot. All these seem to be increasing and are relatively new at some level in Minnesota. So new problems to watch for in addition to the problems we've had all along. So I think there'll be time for comments and questions a little bit later. So I will end my part of this presentation at this point. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Melvick. Thank, thanks to everybody for Tuning in today, we're going to move on to our next speaker. It's um, Bruce Potter. He is a, an Extension Integrated Pest Management Specialist, and he works out of the Southwestern Research and Outreach Center in Lamberton. So Bruce, take it away, and we will have time for questions at the end. Thanks, Angie. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk about an, an insect that's uh, 
new to Minnesota and actually new to science. Uh, it's uh, uh, not been uh, described before, and uh, it's going to be. It's uh, we're starting from scratch with everything on this insect. Um, what we have here is a soybean gall midge. It's uh, one of the gall midge flies in the family Um it's, uh, if you look at the uh, damage it's causing, uh, it takes the lower parts of soybean stems, kind of deteriorates them by the feeding, gives it a corky appearance. Uh, one of the diagnostic characters is where you have the edge of the healthy and, and damaged tissue, you tend to get a real dark or a black uh, border. Uh, the larvae, at least these are mature larvae here, they, they're uh, orange. Uh, these are the adults, these are, uh, uh, pretty distinctive as far as gall midges go. Uh, they've got banded legs. Uh, the wings are mottled. Uh, they have orange ab ab abdomens, rather, and uh, they're about a quarter inch long. Now that quarter inch includes these long legs. This is a, a female on the left. You can see the ovipositor, a male on the right. Uh, they're real tiny. You'll probably not see those in the field. Uh, the ability to tell those apart probably only uh, matters if you're an entomologist or it's probably critical if you're a gall midge. This is a pretty wide and diverse family. Um, a lot of different uh, behaviors and, and uh, uh, feeding preferences with this family. Some are phytophagous like soybean gall midge. They feed inside plant uh, tissue. Some form galls. Some are fungal feeders and some are predaceous, and this is an example of a predaceous gall midge. This is an aphid midge. Uh, they're actually a pretty good uh, predator, an effective predator on soybean aphids. Um, here's the, the, gall, uh, the aphid midge here, and, and uh, they, they can pretty well uh, decimate an aphid colony if, if the populations are relatively low. There's other pest species in this family. One's the hessian fly. Uh, it's a pest of wheat. The wheat midge is a pest of wheat heads. And there's another Rhesicelia in uh, Europe, uh, uh, the raspberry cane midge. The reason I've got these other pests up there is there's maybe some clues we can take uh, from management uh, from these other, uh, other species. Where you're going to find damage is typically at the edge of the field. Uh, where you've got uh, this year's soybeans uh, adjacent to uh, the previous year's soybeans. Uh, you'll see uh, injury at the base of the plant, uh, some discoloration. This is a, these are real small already. When you peel that outer layer back, uh, you'll see the, this is early injury and these little white uh, maggots here are, are our first instar larvae. Here's some, uh, a closer picture of a more advanced uh, infestation. You'll sometimes get some distortion uh, at the base of the plant, uh, dark discoloration. Again, here's that black border between the healthy and green tissue. That damage is usually at the base of the plant, cod lead node or below. Uh, we start to see symptoms at uh, about the V3 stage, and uh, there's a definite planting date relationship. In, there, in other words, uh, the stuff we've looked at this year where you've got two planting dates next to each other, the earlier planting is more, uh, more uh, heavily infested. The larvae start out uh, uh, almost clear or white, and as they develop through three instars, that last instar is going to be orange. And this last instar, once it's done feeding, um, will drop from the plant and, and pupate in the soil. And if it's the last generation in the summer, those will overwinter as larvae. If you're looking at uh, damaged plants, as that damage progresses, plants will start to wilt and die. And uh, as, in, as in the picture on the left, uh, these will uh, attack plant or the, the damage will occur at all stages. So you'll see a progression in dying plants. If you look at the base of that plant, um, there's a, that feeding will form a weak spot. Uh, you'll start to see some plants lodging at the base of the, uh, of the, of the soil. Uh, the wilting will start about three weeks after we see adults. And again, that, that stem breakage and, and wilting will continue through the season. 
appears to have multiple generations and as we go through the season and subsequent generations uh, older plants will die and wilt and die and uh, these infestations with these uh, uh, subsequent infestation will spread through the field here's a, uh, some damage on the edge of the field this is in august this field looks relatively good from a distance but yet we've got 100% of those plants infested at some level with gall midge. So uh, you're going to have to take a close look. Uh, you can't just identify this from the road uh, unless you've got real severe symptoms at the edge of the field. Uh, looking at yield maps, uh, what uh, you can often see is, is uh, low yields uh, where soybean fields rotate back and forth. Here's a field where we've got, uh, these are grass waterways here, and, and this is actually moisture difference on, on this particular area of the slide, picked up with a yield monitor. But in 2016, we have an infestation here. 2017, you can see that damage over here, and it's moving into the field. 2018, it's back over here, not as quite as severe, and this is that same field that we just showed in the picture uh, with the, the distance shot and uh, we've got damage here moving into the field. We've got 60% yield loss at the edge of the field. Some of these more heavily infested fields that they've seen in Nebraska and Iowa are up to 100%, but even 150 feet out in the field where those symptoms are not really visible from uh, without close inspection, uh, we're, we've got over 10% yield loss. So, so the damage can be pretty, pretty significant. This is uh, where we know the uh, gall midge exists. This is the only part of the world that it's been identified in. The red uh, counties are, are uh, fields that were, or counties that were confirmed in 2019. The orange are fields uh, and counties that were confirmed in 2020, or excuse me, 2018, and the orange are fields that were confirmed in 2020. Uh, we picked up a lot of these just moving back and forth between um, Southwest Research and Outreach Center and uh, some research sites down here in Rock County, which is where we first identified this insect in Minnesota. Based on those yield maps I showed earlier uh, in farmer comments, this, this field, this insect had been here quite a bit longer. The first observation of this insect uh, came from Nebraska in uh, about 2011. 2015, they started to pick up some infestations in eastern South Dakota. And 2016, uh, they, they started to see it in eastern Iowa and, uh, and uh, western Nebraska. Now, all these infestations, they were, they were finding late in the season. They were assumed secondary with uh, other diseases. And, uh, excuse me, with other diseases, and they were, uh, um, uh, not assumed to be uh, yield limiting. However, in 2018, uh, in Nebraska, Iowa, South Dakota, these problems really blew up. And until that point, it was assumed that these things were just uh, feeding on decayed and uh, diseased tissue. However, uh, 2018, it became pretty obvious that these things were able to infest soybeans all on their own. There was some confusion, uh, particularly in Minnesota. There's uh, another species that's not actually a soybean pest directly. Um, it's another gall midge, uh, but it feeds on actually uh, on the white mold fungus. Uh, tentatively, we're calling it the white mold gall midge. The larvae are orange, just like uh, soybean gall midge. Uh, the difference is there, you'll find them on the outside of the plant, you'll find them inside the pith, and uh, you know, kind of wherever you're finding the white mold fungus. Again, these are feeding on the fungus itself and, and not, uh, not damaging the soybean directly. But if you, if you uh, look at the larvae by themselves, it's pretty easy to see how you can confuse the two, the two species. They're both small, they're both orange. This is the adult, and again, uh, this looks uh, very much different than uh, the soybean gall midge. The, the legs are solid colored and it doesn't have the modeling on the wing. So <clears throat> basically we started out from scratch here. We didn't know anything about this insect. It's a new species. It's not like soybean aphid when that came in. There was 
Uh, if you could read Chinese, you'd have the ability to, to a little understand a little bit about the life cycle, that sort of thing. And with soybean gall midge, we're making inferences from other, other members of the family and, and related species. So one of the things we wanted to find out is when those adults were actually out and active in the field. So what we did was put out uh, emergence cages in uh, soybean fields. And these are basically just corn rootworm cages. And what we were doing is looking at, checking these on a regular basis, trying to determine what time of year uh, these midges were emerging from the soil as adults. There was a network of these set up through the, uh, through the infested area. Uh, we've got some sites here in, in um, southwest Minnesota that I'll show you some data from in a little bit. Uh, we've also had some, some uh, observation sites over in western Minnesota or eastern Minnesota and further north. Uh, these turned out to be all infestations, uh, 20 infestations, 18 infestations of the, the white mole gall midge. And uh, in fact, this is this field in Stearns County where we had emergence traps. When we caught the first adults, we were pretty confident it was it was a different species and uh, affecting the white mold and infected plants. So this is what emergence looks like. This is cumulative emergence, and we've got two uh, two sites in Rock County here, uh, both on the same farm. And as we go through uh, the growing season. Uh, in the middle, in the uh, middle of June, late June, we we start picking up adults emerging, and then we move the traps over to corn, and we pick up a sec. Or excuse me, these are in corn, uh, the previous year soybeans, and then we move over to uh, infested soybean plants. This year, we get another emergence uh, cycle here. Same in the second field. This emergence, the problem we've got is this emergence with the uh, overwintering adults is uh, pretty extended. It's about two weeks. And if we look at how long these generations are, are persisting in the field from, from adult to adult, it's about 25 to 30 days. Now, later in the summer, in, in August, we started to see another batch of these small white larvae, first generation larvae, and we didn't really notice anything coming out of the emergence cages. Uh, we did have, we did have uh, pick up one here and we're pretty confident this is a third adult flight. Uh, but there may be a reason that we were picking up poor emergence uh, in these emergence cages. Uh, and I'll go, to go over that in just a minute. But the uh, current thought is that these larvae are infesting soybeans at, uh, in, through wounds at the base of the plant. Uh, on the left, we've got a picture of a soybean plant that uh, has a, um, a cra growth crack in it, and these are pretty common. This is the second uh, trifoliate or V2 soybean. The plants on the right are a little bit older. This one's actually already infested. You can kind of see some distortion here, but those older plants will get, get more, uh, more of these cracks throughout the stem. And sometimes in those later generations, the second and third, you'll see infestations a little bit higher up in the plant, but even there predominantly, they're lower down at the base. We don't know exactly uh, if this is the only place they can get in. I would suspect though any kind of injury, hail, uh, maybe even some uh, some uh, pre-emerge herbicide injury to those stems might be uh, an opportunity for the adults to lay eggs. So generally what we try to do when we find a new insect is find some ways to control it and usually the first line of defense is insecticides. The pr problem we've got is that extended adult emergence I just showed you uh, is going to make uh, insecticide control differently. Two weeks uh, for adults to come out, um, that's, a, that's a big target to hit because those eggs are laid and the larvae are inside the plant and once they're there they're, they're difficult to control. And the other problem we've got is the multiple generations um, that, uh, you know, the, the multiple generations make it difficult to, to control the, the insect season long. Uh, the other problem always when you throw, apply an insecticide is it's uh, disruptive to natural enemies. 
question often comes up about seed treatments. Um, the work we've done in Minnesota, we looked at in other states in Iowa, Nebraska, uh, the fields we're working at in Minnesota all had seed, a neonic seed treatment on them. Um, it doesn't look very promising, at least at commonly used rates. So um, the insecticide uh, um, option is going to be a little bit difficult to work out. We did put a uh, trial out in, in Rock County here on one of these uh, infested fields, and what we used was Hero at five ounces an acre. We applied that at B1 or B2, so fairly early. These were small soybeans, and we timed that treatment as close as we could get to the adult emergence. So first day, uh, four days after we caught the first adult is when we put our insecticide on. And we were able to get some, some benefit from that. Uh, if we look at this graph here, we've got the light bars here are the early instar larvae, the first and the second, and these are larvae per plant. Second and third instar larvae, these are the larger orange larvae. And then together, and we managed to pick up about 30% control. There's a, uh, most of that difference is in these uh, early instar larvae. So we might've even had some, some skip through even with that early application. All right, that all looks fine and good, but we've got a problem. And that is that even though we were able to reduce the uh, number of larvae per plant a little bit, um, we were not able to change the percent plants infested. In other words, just as many plants had gall midges where we sprayed and where we didn't spray. The other issue is with those multiple generations by uh, the second generation of midges, we couldn't tell we were or we'd put a treatment on at all. All right, I mentioned uh, that that uh, you know we're worried about disrupting uh, natural enemies. And uh, I mentioned that we were having a, not catching very many uh, midges, adults uh, later in the season. And one of the reasons for that may be biological control already working in the fields uh, that we had our experiments in. Uh, other related uh, gall midge or other me members of the gall midge family have predators. For example, the wheat midge uh, ground beetles have been documented as a, as a good predator of the larvae and pupae in the soil. Uh, others have uh, parasitoids, uh, wasps that uh, attack the larvae. Um, picture on the right, we've got a picture of uh, a parasitoid of a, of a gall midge that attacks uh, cabbages and, and uh, canola. Uh, the swede midge, that's an introduced midge. And, uh, you know, th that whole genus is, is a, a parasite of different members of the gall midge family. Well, what happened was we were trying to get some DNA comparisons between the white mole gall midge and the soybean gall midge. We sent those off to Nebraska, and uh, the first report came back that we didn't have any soybean gall midge uh, in DNA in the gall midges we sent down. I sent some more back down. Uh, what was happening is instead of getting soybean gall midge DNA out of those larvae we sent down, we were getting the larvae of a couple species of platygastrid parasitoid wasps. Um, and, and so that, that's actually good news. We may have some, uh, some things keeping those populations under control um, already, and, and, and that's really promising. So that's one of the things we're going to be looking at uh, increasingly down this summer and, and down, down, down the road. If we look at other management strategies, uh, you know, one of the things we know makes a difference is delayed planning. The problem is it's, it's pretty much delayed planning. We're talking about end of June and uh, we've got lead yield limiting problems with planning dates that late. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is these infestations tend to be really edge focused, at least early in the season. And maybe there's a potential for some trap cropping. In other words, uh, planting some soybeans uh, back in, into the end of this year's corn fields, trying to keep some of those, uh, those gall midge in, in the, from moving into this year's soybeans and then uh, control and, and taking them out of the corn, those plants out of the corn. It's one of the things that might work. Um, maybe we can minimize damage if we can just keep that first generation, that overwintering generation from getting a good foothold. Host plant resistance is usually how people try to attack uh, midge problems. And, and uh, at this point, we don't know of anything. It'd be a really useful tool 
Uh, there's some screening been started, but at this point, nothing been identified that I'm aware of as far as uh, um, effective uh, genetics against the gall mitch. All right, so what we've got uh, is three uh, adult flight periods during the growing season. There may be more, there may be less. Uh, as we get into the later in the season, um, you know, some of those flights could overlap, kind of like univoltine corn borer and, and second generation corn borer do. Um, again, it's going to make uh, adult control kind of difficult. We're assuming that this is temperature dependent. Um, so we're gonna have to do a little more, more work on this to just uh, dial that in a little bit better. Uh, at this point, again, it looks like there is at least two full larval generation and one partial generation that overwinters on soybeans. And again, the good news is we may have some biocontrol that's already functioning in Minnesota. Here's the issue. Most of the pests we're dealing with in Minnesota, we're, we're doing some IPM practices, for example, scouting and using thresholds, um, maybe using some host plant resistance, um, that sort of thing. But this insect really might force us to use actual IPM because at this point, no single uh, management tactic has been proven uh, effective all by itself. Everything gets a little bit of control. Um, and we're going to probably have to implement some uh, complementary management practices, do more than one thing to keep these populations under control. Uh, a lot of this work has been done uh, as part of a, a team, and uh, Justin McMicken at uh, University of Nebraska is heading it up. Uh, these are some of the people that are working at it. And uh, I'd like to say thanks to the students and, and uh, Travis Wolmer, who was my technician, uh, technician. Um, also all the agronomists and consultants who's uh, helped to limit these soybean gall midge populations, and uh, Minnesota soybean growers and, and the checkoff dollars that have helped fund some of this research. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. Now we're going to open this up for questions, and so as these questions roll in, those that don't know how to, to enter a question, just go to the bottom of your screen and there should be a, a little bubbles, like people, you know, uh, dialogue bubbles. And it should say Q&A. If you click on that, you can type your question into the, the box and then um, we'll ask those of the, the presenters. So first question right now is for Dr. Malvik. Um, so for, for the diseases that you talked about, how long do the, the pathogens remain viable in, in the residue? Hmm. That's, that's a good question. And it's different for each one. You know, bacteria tend to be less resilient, less long lasting than many fungi, for example. Uh, we don't know a lot about the bacterial leaf streak, for example, on corn. Um, I, I would expect at least a year or two, but once the residue truly breaks down into small fragments, I, I suspect it won't survive very long, but we don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I mentioned tar spot before. Um, when that was first found in the US, it was a curiosity, as I mentioned. It was only known in Latin America in much warmer climates at that point, and everybody wondered could it survive, but as I mentioned, it does survive fine. It survived well over the winter of 2018-19, which we all remember had some very cold periods. In uh, That was in northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin. So the general rule is cold weather doesn't seem to do much to damage most pathogens. Breakdown of the residue is probably the bigger factor. And so it's often going to be longer than a year, though. Okay, and uh, one more question for you, Dr. Melvick. So those pictures that you were showing of the, the tar spot infestations or infections from above, those plants, I believe you said it was from Iowa, perhaps, or Michigan? Michigan, Michigan. Why, why do you think that those large patches are, are developing within the field? Is there any indication that the tar spot pathogen might be seed transmitted? 
it, it's it uh, again this is such a new disease and we have don't have a lot of work done on here in the u.s the potential for seed transmission is there although i don't think we have a good understanding of what the potential is for that to happen so i i wouldn't rule that one out i i think um those patches represent previous infections um, and residue in the fields that were infected. That's my guess. And the disease spread from those areas. And the field that I mentioned in Southern Fillmore County where I went, it was seemed to be localized in a patch, you know, well away from the edge of the field, like I said. And the question is, how would it get there? Um, I, I don't have a good answer. I mean, the spores can move and blow some distance. We don't know exactly how far. Um, so they could land in one part of the field where they get the right conditions for infection and start. I mean, that's a possibility. The other thing is that there was residue from a previous year where there was infection and it started there. It won't take very many leaves, you know, to start a new uh, focus of infection from which it can spread. So I think we have a lot of questions here, but those are some of the ideas that are floating around. Thank you, Dr. Melvick. Um, Bruce, a couple of questions for you. Um, are there more generations of the soybean gall midge that occur further south within a particular growing season? Um, it doesn't appear to be. It appears that uh, we're all pretty much in sync. And this, this number of generations uh, is, is kind of tentative at this point. Uh, we don't have a good way to, we can't rear these things in the, in the lab yet. They're, we're having a hard time domesticating them. Uh, so we're, until we can do that and get the, you know, real precise degree day uh, information, um, it's going to be hard to know, but it looks like these overwinter, or excuse me, these generations overlap a little bit, particularly towards the end of the season. But it seems like everybody's picking up about the same number of flights in the, in the, emergence cages and uh, I think that's I think we're pretty close on on at least on at least three adult flights and and two two generations maybe in a warm year in an early spring uh, we might have a few more or have another generation uh, possible I think one of the reasons that uh, we're not seeing as heavy of infestations as, as some other areas is is in most of Minnesota particularly western Minnesota where we're finding finding the gall midge at this point, uh, we had a lot of real late soybean planting and, and that would not have been conducive to uh, this, you know, good early season establishment. So do, does your research group, the group of folks that are working together on soybean gall midge, have any idea about what might have changed in 2018 to make it more of a threat? I know you had mentioned earlier on it was more of a kind of a late season issue people thought it was maybe coming in with disease do you know what changed in 2018 um I'm, it, one of two things probably happened either the environment became more favorable uh or the other other possibility is that you know this thing has multiple generations a year and as a result um you know, you can build that population to a higher level with each subsequent, subsequent generation. So we might have built a population pretty fairly high in 20, uh, 2017. And then when the spring of 2018 uh, started, that, that first generation was, was large enough to really be, do some damage and become noticeable. Uh, we don't know if this is uh, a native insect and adapting to soybeans or if it's been introduced. Uh, Nebraska has found uh, that it some found the soybean gall midge on a couple other host plants. One is uh, alfalfa to a limited extent, and then also on uh, on sweet clover. So uh, we're a little, like I say, this is all brand new, and and uh, uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to sort sort it out. Okay, we have another question here. For, for Bruce, would it be beneficial to spray field edges multiple times during the early growing season to prevent further infestation into the interior of the field? 
Uh, if you could get the timing down correctly, and and the problem we've got is is if you're doing that, um, you're you're definitely going to disrupt any of the uh, bio, any kind of biological control you have. If we if you have some of those parasitic wasps in in the field, you're going to disrupt those. Um, and the other problem is putting insecticides that often on the edge of the field. Uh, can lead to resistance in, in secondary insects, mites, uh, if you're spraying uh, soybean aphids uh, inadvertently, that sort of thing. So I guess I wouldn't recommend it. Um, you know, I think the, the, the way we're going to have to manage it with insecticide is if we can figure out the timing, and then we might have to look at some different insecticidal property or products maybe that have, uh, have some ability to, to be uh, systemic and translocated a little bit in that plant to get to the larvae uh, that are inside. So one more question for, for Bruce. Um, which insecticides are labeled for soybean gall midge management? Um, I think there's at this point actually labeled, there is uh, only one of them, one of the Syngenta products and uh, I'm off the top of my head, I cannot remember which one it is. Um, but but uh, there are there are insecticides labeled for soybeans, so uh, we don't have anything. Uh, nobody's found anything that's that's really effective, and uh, you know anything that's being done is pretty much done on a, on an experimental basis. Um, yeah, I, I guess I guess. Uh, I guess there's a few, there's a, there are some compounds labeled, but, but uh, I don't know of anything that actually has been proven to work very well. Okay, um, one more question. Do other midges give us clues about what um, might be the host range of soybean gall midge? Um, generally, it's, they're limited to a, a um, single family, that's my understanding. There's people that spend their whole life studying that particular um, order of insects or family of insects, but um, generally they're restricted to one family, sometimes, uh, you know, a few species. And uh, in the case of the gall midge, uh, we don't know how, how widespread the host range is, it, it, but I'm, I'm assuming that it might be a safe assumption that it's restricted to legumes. Um, a lot of questions have come up is can it attract, attack dry beans um, and, and that sort of thing. And so far it hasn't been documented on, on, uh, on any other host besides soybeans and, and just recently alfalfa and, and sweet clover. Um, the problem is going to be to do those host range studies really well. We're going to have to get some, some lab colonies going that we can work with. Um, otherwise, it's going to be more or less having to find them in the field, which is a difficult, difficult task. One more question for, for Dr. Malvik. Are there varieties, soybean varieties, that have high levels of resistance to the, the frog eye pathogen in our maturity groups in, in Minnesota? That's a very good question that's come up this winter. And as I mentioned, there is resistance in our southern and southern varieties, none of which grow well here. I, I've asked a number of folks that working with seed companies and none of them knew off the top of their heads. This is not something that's come up as a, as a key question or a key trait that anybody bought, has bought upon. So I don't have an answer. Um, I think we need to look through some of the seed catalogs and see if the trait is even listed. I think since it's not been important, I, I think it's not been a priority. And you know, this was true, you know, 10 years ago too, when, when Goss's wilt became a big deal. Very few of the catalogs, seed catalogs, had a, a trait column for Goss's wilt resistance, even though some of the hybrids did have resistance, um, although some of them clearly didn't. But no, I don't, I don't know the answer for sure about frog eye resistance for maturity groups of soybeans adapted to Minnesota. Well, thank you. Dr. Melvick, thank you, Bruce Potter, for, for spending time with us all here today. Please take a look in the chat box, everyone. There is a, a very short um, link to a, a 
feedback quiz kind of. I, it's just a couple of questions. We would like to know what you think about this format and um, if you had any, qu any um, additional questions, please be sure to, to either contact the presenters directly or um, contact the either me or you can contact Phyllis or type it in the, the chat box or the Q&A box and we'll get answers out to you. So we wanted to thank everybody for tuning in with us here today and um, have, a, have a great rest of your day.